الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كفين فيه أبدا وينذر الذين قالوا اتخذ الله ولدا ما لهم به من علم ولا لآبائهم كبرت كلمة تخرج من أفواههم إن يقولون إلا كذبا فلعلك باخع نفسك على آثارهم إن لم يؤمنوا بهذا الحديث أسفا إنا جعلنا ما على الأرض زينة لها لنبلوهم أيهم أحسن عملا وإنا لجاعلون ما عليها صعيدا جرزا أم حسبت أن أصحاب الكهف والرقيم كانوا من آياتنا عجبا إذ أوى الفتية إلى الكهف فقالوا ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا فضربنا على آذانهم في الكهف سنين عددا ثم بعثناهم لنعلم أي الحزبين أحصى لما لبثوا أمدا نحن نقص عليك نبأهم بالحق إنهم فتية آمنوا بربهم وزدناهم هدى وربطنا على قلوبهم إذ قاموا فقالوا ربنا رب السماوات والأرض لن ندعو من دونه إلها لقد قلنا إذا شططا هؤلاء قومنا اتخذوا من دونه آلهة لولا يأتون عليهم بسلطان بين فمن أظلم ممن افترى على الله كذبا وإذ اعتزلتموهم وما يعبدون إلا الله فأقوا إلى الكهف ينشر لكم وإذ اعتزلتموهم وما يعبدون إلا الله فأقوا إلى الكهف ينشر لكم ربكم من رحمته ويهيئ لكم من أمركم مرفقا وترى الشمس إذا طلعت تزاور عن كهفهم ذات اليمين وإذا غربت تقرضهم ذات الشمال وهم في فجوة منه ذلك من آيات الله من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وتحسبهم أيقاظا وهم رقود 
ونقلبهم ذات اليمين وذات الشمال وكلبهم باسط ذراعيه بالوصيد لو اطلعت عليهم لوليت منهم فرارا ولملئت منهم رعبا وكذلك بعثناهم ليتساءلوا بينهم قال قائل منهم كم لبثتم قالوا لبثنا يوما أو بعض يوم قالوا ربكم أعلم بما لبثتم فبعثوا أحدكم بورقكم هذه إلى المدينة فلينظر أيها أزكى طعاما فليأتكم برزق منه وليتلطف ولا يشعرن بكم أحدا إنهم إن يظهروا عليكم يرجموكم أو يعيدوكم في ملتهم ولن تفلحوا إذا أبدا وكذلك أعثرنا عليهم ليعلم أن وعد الله حق وأن الساعة لا ريب فيها لا ريب فيها إذ يتنازعون بينهم أمرهم فقالوا ابنوا عليهم بنيانا ربهم أعلم بهم قال الذين غلبوا على أمرهم لنتخذن عليهم مسجدا سيقولون ثلاثة رابعهم كلبهم ويقولون خمسة سادسهم كلبهم رجما بالغيب ويقولون سبعة وثامنهم كلبهم قل رب أعلم بعدتهم ما يعلمهم إلا قليل فلا تمار فيهم إلا مراء ظاهرا ولا تستفت فيهم منهم أحدا ولا تقولن لشيء إني فاعل ذلك غدا إلا أن يشاء الله واذكر ربك إذا نسيت وقل عسى أن يهديني ربي لأقرب من هذا رشدا ولبثوا في كهفهم ثلاثمائة سنين وازدادوا تسعا قل لله أعلم بما لبثوا له غيب السماوات والأرض أبصر به وأسمع ما لهم من دونه من ولي ولا يشرك في حكمه أحدا واتل ما أوحي إليك من كتاب ربك لا مبدل لكلماته ولن تجد من دونه ملتحدا صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم إن عفوك عن ذنبي
That's from the Husn al the, the positive uh, unlook of Brother Hassan for me. And uh, for me, he's an older brother who I dearly love, as well as Haj Hassan, who uh, are an inspiration to me. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them for all the forward in his way. And inshallah, this is a poem which is part of it is includes reflection. It is about Palestine. And something to keep in mind is this poem was written in 2021 about events that happened in 2014. And that just shows you how long this genocide has been taking place and how long the brothers and sisters in Palestine have been under this oppression. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives victory to those who are fighting in his way against the oppressors of the world. And uh, we just want to remember uh, that the, the number of people that you see dying, sometimes we forget that these are people with families. Inshallah, this hopes to humanize and uh, naturalize one of these that's taking place. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Tonight, we are not in Dearborn. We are where hearts are broken and bleeding, but its drops are seedlings that have planted in the soil of the Holy Land that are growing as tonight we stand as the unified children of Abraham, as sons and daughters of Muhammad, Moses, and Jesus, where our brothers and sisters lay in pieces, but not so fast. Before we see how we got here, in order for you to journey with me, I need you all to close your eyes and take four deep breaths. Transport yourself with me. Imagine yourself a child with no cares and no fear, playing on the cobblestones with no protection from an iron dome. The only place that you have ever called home, the scent of lemon trees whistling through the winds. As you take a fresh breath of air in, the sun kisses your skin. The slightly cool breeze of the Mediterranean cools your neck as you rush to the beach with your friends. As you look up and smile with a rush of excitement, a summer day inviting you to live, a soccer ball of innocence, kicked between the rotating stars of your adolescence, forced to rotate at the speed of light to learn what life is like in a place where the beach becomes your burial site. But you don't know that yet. The World Cup in the summer by the sea gave you the extra push to play soccer as you kicked and laughed, passed and passed, kicked and laughed, passed and passed, and shot the ball in the net. You shot the ball because that's how you score. Sending the ball streaming through the air, and in the brief moment, you feel excited and scared looking at an empty net as it comes to its target. You become a target. And as the ball left your feet, flying away from your sand-covered heels, something else flying towards you came, made of steel, loaded inside, not with laughs, but tears, ready to explode, loaded with flames that would burn you, your family, and your home. There is no iron dome to protect you, no one to respect your innocence, for on your birth certificate they stamped you were a terrorist. And your birthplace, they are trying to replace, rename. Have they no shame as the steel suspended in the air falls down like rain and now there is nothing but silence. No more violence. I wish you could see yourself as the artillery hit that sent you flying through the air, becoming an angel in the same instant that they transformed to demons. Killed without reason on the beach of Gaza. Zakaria Ahid Bakr, 10 years old. Ahid Atif Bakr, 10 years old. Ismail Muhammad Bakr, 9 years old. 
Muhammad Ramiz Bakr, 11 years old. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Let's thank him with the largest of salawats. Okay. Oh, the Bilam Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. All praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. May his peace and blessings be on our beloved Prophet. I said, as the events that are happening in Palestine, it's also an opportunity. For I said, heaven is infinite. Nothing better to reaching high stages of heaven through opportunities like are happening now making sure you're on the right side of history it's not about heaven or hell it's very difficult to go to hell it's about the levels of heaven and reaching it not because you want to reach heaven it's because you want to get closer to allah because you're in love and that's one of the most powerful emotions that you could have is when you fall in love with your beloved who will never betray you and then Maybe you may be lucky enough where you will attract somebody who will also do the same for you in this world. You don't need it. So if you're single, if you never get married, or if you're married in a tough relationship, it doesn't matter. You have your beloved. That's all that you need. Thus, we have scholars that we follow. We follow the Marjaya. We follow to teach us how to fall in love. We need a guide. And you can't bypass the Sharia. Sharia is level one, step one, how to pray, how to fast. That's only step one. Unfortunately, within our community, it's almost presented as the last step. Eventually, I will pray. Eventually, I will fast. Eventually, I will go to Hajj. But actually, in Islam, it's step one. That way, you could go into different dimensions. Because if you try to go into different dimensions without the help of Allah, it could actually have detrimental effects. For instance, there are people who could invoke spirits who could speak to your dead they, Allah has given them that ability they could speak to your loved ones but it doesn't mean they're going to heaven or hell it's just an ability that they have and there's so many dimensions to us that we could achieve but Sharia is what purifies us so it's the the birth of Imam Ali Islam that we're celebrating I'm going to speak a little bit about him and the, the goal today is to build on trustworthy relationships and last week was First time we brought up three sisters, and I'm, thank you for that. It was the first time, and you answered tough questions, and you were pro pro proved that you're authentic. So today, we don't have to do it, but different questions for brothers. So I would like, it's almost gonna be like a counseling session. So one, it's somebody that has to have thick skin. Two, it's somebody that's willing to expose themselves a little bit. And three, it's somebody who wants to get help in any way. So if by the end of the discussion, you're brave enough to come up, then you will come up. If more than one wants to come up, we could do it too. And if not, that's okay too, because we're gonna answer the questions anyway amongst ourselves. So thank you everybody for joining. Let's begin inshallah. So this is one of the narrations of Imam Ali, a letter warning his governors. If there's a, in the United Nations, there's a letter he wrote to Malik al-Ashtar on how to govern. All you have to look up is Imam Ali, Malik al-Ashtar letter. It's written, it's in the United Nations. It's one of the greatest pieces of literature. If you ever want to know what justice is, you just have to read that letter. 
Even the United Nations recognize it, and so many other people recognize it. It's all about justice through truth. So there was a person who came to Imam, to Omar, the first caliph. And the woman said, I committed adultery. So he said, well, was there witnesses? She said, yes. She said, okay, this is the punishment. She says, but I have one condition. I want Imam Ali to pass judgment. So Omar called Imam Ali Salam to come. And he says, what judgment do you pass on this woman who's committed adultery and has said that she wants to be punished? So he asked her a question. Why did you do it? She says, because my kids were in need and I had no other means of food. So this is what this man told me I had to do in order to feed my children. So Imam Ali says, you're free to go. There's no punishment. So Umar says, why? How did you free her? He says, because Allah tells her to free. What does Allah say? But whoever is forced by severe hunger with no inclination to sin, where they sin anyway, they need Allah is forgiving and merciful. That one ayah. Look how merciful Allah is. Where if you sin, even create one of the worst sins, there's no sin on you. You're forgiven. Why? Because Allah says if you're so pressed and oppressed and you commit haram, there's no sin on you. Allah will forgive you. That's the justice of Imam Ali. So every once in a while we're going to share some stories as I go from one slide to another. The next one. Should I sleep with a full stomach when around me there are hungry stomachs and livers dry with thirst? How could I eat if my companions are hungry? There's books that people wrote, Leaders Eat Last, where the people were so inspired to follow Imam Ali because they knew he wouldn't eat until they ate first. They're already motivated to follow Imam Ali. But what did Imam Ali do? He inspired them. And those were the companions that were so close to him. But the sad thing is, he said, I would trade 11 of my companions for one of Mu'alias. I said, why? He says, look how loyal they are. Even though it's for the dunya, they'll give their life for it. For me, the prophet came. He warned them. But look, they're not motivated. So it's proof you can't motivate people. You could inspire them, but you can't motivate them. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, to let go of some belief. Let it be a relationship, you waiting for somebody to change, and you keep thinking you have to motivate them. You don't. In this school, who are the teachers that we look for? Not the ones that we have to motivate to inspire children. The ones that already know what the goal and the why is where we built this institution. What are the students look, we look for? Same thing. The ones that know every day we're going to speak about Allah, and every day is an opportunity to get closer to Allah. That's the motivation. So the role of a blank is not to come up with all the great ideas. The role of a blank is to, to create an environment in which uh, great ideas could happen. What's the answer? Leader, right? So let's look at a leader like Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, for example, did not personally come up with the iPad, iTunes, or the iPhone. Others inside the company did. Jobs gave people a filter, a context of higher purpose around which to innovate, find existing status quo industries that in which companies fight to protect their old-fashioned businesses models. He challenges them. This is why Apple was founded. So who are the people that he attracted to work for him? Are the people who wanted to challenge the status quo. And then he created an environment where people created the iPhone, iTunes. So what environment are you creating to inspire people? Are you constantly having to motivate your workers? Are you constantly having to motivate your staff? Are you constantly having to motivate your children? That means you're a bad leader. One, because you attracted the wrong people. Or two, you've attracted the right people, but you don't know how to inspire them. It's all on you. If the school isn't doing well, Haj Hassanin taught me a rule. I right away take 70% of the blame. Anything happens in the school, I'm 70% the blame. Then I'll take it from there. I'm building a cathedral, volunteer. Who would like to volunteer about their job they're currently working in? Who's the brave soul? All right, where are you working? What's your name, so everybody knows? Jaffa, where do you work? PA Solutions, what do you do? 
You're a design engineer. All right, Jaffer, uh, how's the pay? Okay, if I had another job where you're doing similar, you get great pay, would you take it right now? I'll double your pay. How fast was he able to sell out PA solutions? <laughs> if you have any job that you're willing to leave for greater pay, then you're not inspired to work, Jaffer, you're manipulated. All for what? Money. So look at people who built a cathedral, right? The two think of two stonemasons. <laughs> which one are you currently? So you have to ask, which one are you? Because why would you want to be manipulated to work, right? Now, if Jaffer was inspired, and he loved them, and he believed in their mission, just like the employees of Steve Jobs did, because Steve Jobs could be harsh, he could be in your face, but guess what they would not do? Quit, because they believed. Let's say if that company is a company that you believed in, that they're helping the same cause that you believe in. Guess what? What's one thing you wouldn't care about? Your pay or anything else. And I ask you, take double over here. You say, no, I'm inspired. This is what I wake up for every day. You can't pay me anything because I, this is what I work for. So two stonemasons, first one, would probably take another job for more pay, just like Jaffer. You'd say, it's too hot in here. It's, I'm, I'm lifting these big boulders. What is this? It's the middle of the summer. And when this cathedral is not going to even finish in my lifetime. So you got to ask, which one are you? Because if you're in a life where you're manipulated and you don't like what you're doing, it's going to affect your relationships. Do you agree? It's hard to be in a job for eight hours a day where you feel manipulated, where you would quit in a heartbeat if somebody offered you something better. Now you have to be, now you have to be nice to your kids. It's difficult, right? So now, the first one is, they'll drop it in a heartbeat. Here's a better job, more pay. You don't have to worry about the heat. Or you could be the second one. Here's the second one. The inspired stonemason works longer hours, would probably turn down an easier, higher paying job to stay and be part of the higher cause. That's why. That's why Imam Ali said, I'll change, I'll trade 11, 10 of my soldiers for one of Mu'alias because they're so inspired to do haram for him. Where as soon as the Prophet died, they weren't motivated to fight for the right of Imam Ali. They weren't inspired. That's proof if the Prophet couldn't inspire them, if they uh, motivate them, if the Imam couldn't, could you? You know, Gary V said something very good. You guys know who Gary V is? He's brilliant in terms of business. You know what he said? He asked them, how do you know who to hire? He says, I don't. He says, then what? He says, I know who to fire, and I don't wait. Some of you give opportunities to people in jobs that you shouldn't because they're a family member, because they're a bias. But if that was a complete stranger, you wouldn't do that. Imam Ali was just. It didn't matter who that person was in front of them. Yes. Okay. Langley. You guys know who Langley is? Anybody? Nope. Langley had the best and brightest minds to do what? Anybody know? Anybody know? SubhanAllah. Best and brightest mind to have the first aircraft to fly. He was the smartest. He had money, was no object. Government funded endlessly. He even had the finest materials. He even had the press follow him. What was he looking for? Why did he want to make sure the press was following him every move? So why did he fail? Do you, get, you guys don't even know. Who were the first people to fly a plane? Which brothers? The Wright brothers. They were 100 miles away from him. Why did he fail? He wanted to be the first. He wanted to be rich. He wanted to be famous. He knew how to do it. He had the best. He knew what to do, but what was weak is why. So then the Wright brothers had no funding from the government, had no connections, didn't even have a college education. But guess what? 
they were the first to do it. Why? Because of their why. They wanted to change the world for the better. And what did they do? They inspired people to do the same. Now, those people they didn't get paid like Langley's group, but they said, we don't care. We have our why. Even if we don't get paid anything, we want to change the world. They weren't for sale. So he had an inspired team. Guess what Langley did? As soon as they did it, they quit. Couldn't he have taken what they did and made it better? Yes. And then we may have remembered him in history. But what did he do? He said, I'm embarrassed and I quit. And now nobody even knows his name. Why? Because his why was so weak. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Why would someone follow you? Right? Because the Wright brothers got people to follow them. Why would somebody follow you? See, Jaffa, if you have a job that you don't like, an environment that you don't like, and then you tell people to follow you, you'd be like, why should I follow you? You don't like your job. You just said you don't make a lot of money. Why would I want that? Now imagine you come home every day and your kids see you angry, your kids see you unhappy, your kids see you not smiling, your kids see you not following the ways of the Prophet and Nahl Bayt. Are they going to want to follow you when they get older? No. So there are three reasons why people follow you. First, they're paid to. Jafar, the only reason why you follow that company is because they pay you. Because you would drop them in a second if they stop paying you. You agree? Right? Some of us, we have to bribe our kids to take out the garbage, to do chores. You have to pay them. That's one reason. Second, because they have to. Your kids listen to you because they feel they have to. You do what you do at work, Jafar, because you feel like you have to or else you will get fired. Not because you want to. How many people do things because they want to? How do you know that? Do your kids want to help you because they want to? Or is it always about manipulation, not inspiration? If you don't do this, I'm going to do this to you. Why does it always have to be a transaction when it comes to raising our kids? Why can't it be taught out of love? How do we do that? Why do you follow Islamic teachings? Why do you follow Islam? It's because somebody manipulated you? Just like Jaffer got manipulated? Because if I don't do this, my dad won't buy me this car, or my parents would have looked at me this. And thus, this is the reason why. And is that the reason why you rebelled from Islam? Because you wanted nothing to do with people who manipulated to force you to do what they do, from wearing hijab and so on? Because I would rebel if I was forced. Look how fast Jafar was willing to sell out his company. How fast are you willing to sell out Islam if you're paid to do it or if you have to? How many people you know truly follow the ways of Islam because they want to. How will you know? By their behavior. By their behavior. Just like this see, Jaffer was for sale. Are you for sale? When something in this world, let it be a drug, let it be something haram, come in your way, how do you know you follow Islam because you want to is when you're put in those circumstances. So which one are you of the three? Tell the person next to you, go. <laughs> Have that conversation. Okay, so I'm not picking on anybody. Should have, I should have people start signing waivers. But imagine somebody comes to you, let's say, who can I pick on that's got thick skin that doesn't wear hijab? 
Sam? <laughs> Raise your hand. Who's got thick skin that I can pick on? What's your name? Rania. Rania, if I gave you the hijab right now, will you wear it for the rest of your life? No. Why? Because you had to, you were forced to, right? Somebody, right? You weren't ready, right? But, so you're not ready. How about if I gave you a million dollars a year to wear it? Ten million. <laughs> Rania, would you kill yourself? How about if I give you ten million to kill yourself? Is your life priceless then? Is there any amount of money I could give you, right? that you would kill yourself. So we all agree your life is priceless. So Rania, I have a question for you. Remember, you said you have thick skin. Why is it I could give you $10 million a year to wear a scarf in your head, but when God tells you to wear it, who's given you life which is priceless, more than $10 million a year, why do you say no? And Rania, I want you to answer from the heart because it's a question that's not posed. So if you could answer from the heart, maybe it could resonate to people why they do what they do. And there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. You guys get the... Go ahead. Yeah. Good. But Ronnie, you said you would do it for 10 million. Right. By the way, Rania, you do it for a million. <laughs> by, by the way, Rania, so would everybody else. You agree? So here's the difference. Let's say I just told you, Hassan is probably the most trustworthy person in the room, and he's got a million dollars. He's going to give it to you. You say, ah, I trust him. He's never lied. Right? The difference is, you guys follow? In Hassan, you believed him. You believed him, thus you put on the hijab. The reason why you don't put on the hijab yet is because you don't believe in it. Because you believed in the billion dollars, but you still don't believe it's Allah's commandment to the point where you should change your life for it. So all you have to do, and it's on you, to strengthen your belief. And it's on nobody else's business if you wear it or don't. Because if you wear it and you don't believe in it, just like you said, you take it off. So it's on you. Now, I just showed you the ayah. Allah says, if you're forced to do something, even a sin, but there was suppression, Allah's forgiving. So to dare say somebody's going to go to hell because they don't wear hijab, or to dare say somebody's going to go to heaven because they're not going to, because they, because they were, it's got nothing to do. That's not the judgment that you're supposed to be talking. You're not even supposed to have those discussions. Who are you? Because you don't know why, when, where that person was at. But it is about belief. So that's why we do these programs, to strengthen our belief to the point where you don't need anybody but Allah. And yes, Allah has given you this existence, which is priceless, and you'll be living forever. There is no such thing as pure death. There is no fana. And that's the beauty about Islam, is that when that hits in your heart, you realize there's nothing in this world that's worth taking me away from that. And that's where you have to strengthen your belief, and that's where it goes to your childhood. So guess what I'm going to do when I ask the brothers to come up? Talk about what? Your childhood. All right. So here's another problem. When leaders, scholars, governors take a position, Imam Ali says, you want to know who will be the ones resurrected as lions? They're going to die. You're going to see this is a lion. Why is he not amongst the angels? Why is he an animal? Why is he a lion? He says, because he was a person of power. But guess what's one thing he didn't have? Humbleness. See, if she decided to put out, take off her hijab because somebody of power suppressed her in any way, he could possibly res res be resurrected as a lion because he said, but, excuse me, somebody who didn't show humbleness when he was, had the state of power. What's the worst? Na'anyahu is arrogant with his power. And he thinks it's because of him and Allah will expose him. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So once Imam Ali gave the same share to two women, 
One was Arab and the other was non-Arab. People raised objections in response. He said, I did not find any difference between the two. Continental Airline was losing hundreds of millions of dollars every year. Do you know, they hired a new CEO. Do you know the first thing he did? He found out which executives were bad, right? To the point he wanted to know, and he looked up to see which executives held up the plane because they were running late, that they were willing to hang, hold up all the customers. Do you know what he did? He fired all those executives. Who were the executives? All they cared about was bonuses and margins. They didn't care about the employees at all. So he got rid of them, right? So he removed security. There was security on the top floor. He wasn't easily accessible. He removed it. He made himself very easily accessible. And he didn't dif differentiate between an executive and an employee to the point he would go to the airport and help with the baggages. That's how accessible he made himself. You know what else he did? He bonuses. He told the people, if you could get the planes clean and taken out on time, I'm going to give everybody a $65 bonus. And it's going to be a separate check. And it would cost the company millions of dollars. But guess what happened? It changed the culture. Now the employee was no longer willing to quit like Jaffer. But now they were inspired to be better. Why? Because they had a leader who found the people who are already motivated but was willing to inspire. Thus the importance of following a marja, following a scholar that inspires us. I follow Sheikh Shomali, I follow Sheikh Bahmanpur, I follow Sheikh Sakalashfar, is because they inspire me. But if I'm not motivated, anything they tell me is not going to get me. And unfortunately, some parents have kids that are like that, and you're going to have to wait. You keep kicking yourself, saying, why are they not changing? Because they're not motivated yet. If the prophet couldn't do it, who are you? All right. Whoever desires to be fair to the people, let him love for them as he loves for themselves. So when, who, who slept in the Prophet's bed? Imam Ali. The Prophet took off to Medina, correct? With Abu Bakr, correct? Yes. Then, he gave him a piece of paper to Imam Ali. He says, I have all this money, because I was the, the, the bank for these people. Give it back. Make sure everybody gets back the right. So what does Abu Sufyan, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal decide to do? Let's go tell Imam Ali that we gave him $100,000 to the Prophet, give us the money. I said, okay. So the Imam was like, you three gave the Prophet money? I said, yeah. I said, okay, do you mind? Let me split you up. Abu Jahal, what time of the day did you give him money? Oh, it was morning. Abu Lahab, what time of the day did you give it? Afternoon. <laughs> Abu Jahal, what time? Evening. He says, okay, all three of you are liars. The teacher, there's a, there's a group of students, four students. They wanted to conspire against the teacher. They said, okay, we have a final. And we said, we're going to miss, and we'll tell the teacher we got a flat tire. That way, the other students give us the exam. This is a true story. So the next day, the teacher says, no problem, you could take your exam. So they were flying through it. They had all the answers. He put them each in a separate room. It was the same exact exam. But guess what the teacher did? She had one different last question. Guess what the question was? Which tire was flat? <laughs> and they all got it wrong. And that was the gift of the imam. Within two seconds, he could expose a lie. And people would be inspired by him because he knew he wasn't for sale. He was so gifted. A Jewish man came up to him. He says, no one could answer this question. He says, what's the question? He said, what number can you divide by 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and still get a whole number? What number? So Imam Ali salam, says, take the number of days in a year. Now he answered his question with a question. Take the number of days in a lunar year, average, what is it? It's a 360. Take, and times it by the number of days in a week. What's that? Seven. Seven. So if you take 360 times 7, you get 2,520. 
And if you divide it by 10, you get a whole number. If you divide it by 9, you get a whole number. If you divide it by 8, you get a whole. It's the only number out there where you could keep dividing. The Jewish guy was perplexed. He says, not only did you answer my question, you answered it with a question. How'd you do it so fast? He told the guy, what's 1 plus 1? So two. He said, how did you do that fast? Because it was easy. He says, this is easy for me. Salawat. Why would we not follow him as our leader? And I could go on and on and on. And I could do the same with the Holy Quran. I could give you the miracles within the Quran that would just blow your mind and say, what else is there to follow? But that's the point, is to strengthen our belief through this. All right. Um, we'll skip the candle. What trust people? We trust people who, with common values and beliefs. We agree? If you have the common beliefs as me and the common values, you will trust me. For instance, if I was an atheist, didn't believe in God, and I'm trying to have these types of conversations, would you trust me? No. So you would first have to know who I am to have more trust. Okay. We are, we are friends with people who see the world the way we see it, who share our views and beliefs. You agree? We're all in agreement? Good. No matter how good a match someone looks on paper, what, what doesn't guarantee a good relationship? So if I tell you there's somebody who's, you want, let's say you're looking to get married, somebody who's, she's gorgeous, she prays, she fasts, she's a Muslim, she's, um, she's young, she's everything, she's a pharmacist, she's very giving and forgiving, she's compassionate, she's wise. I said, oh my God, yeah, that's who I want. I said, okay. And then she comes, and she's black. And she has different cultural and different standards. Will it work? Maybe not, probably not. Right? Because you might have different cultures. You might have different traditions. You have, may have different things that you follow. So outwardly, everything may look great, but you may, your values may be different than her values. And you never know. So here we go. Forming relationships and environments aligned with our values and beliefs lead to deeper connections. It's essential to bond not just with anyone interested, but with those who generally share out core principles. This is in harmony with the Quran when it says, and he has made between you affection and mercy. So you have to make sure you are affectionate. You have to make sure you're merciful to everybody for you to attract that, and then Allah will bring you somebody. Because you don't find love, you attract it. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Good luck. Why would you do that? You do it Allah's way, and Allah sends you somebody, and then Allah is the one that puts the love between you and that person. All right. Uh, now, let's say this is an accountant position. And this is the way that most companies publicize. If you go to Indeed or any other, this is how they publicize. They said, accountant executive needed. Minimum five years experience, must have working knowledge of industry, come work for a fantastic, fast-growing company with a great pay and a great benefit. The ad produced loads of applicants, but how do we know which is the right fit? This is how Jaffer got. They got Jaffer, right? They told them how to do it. They told them what to do, but what, why will Jaffer quit in an instant? Because of why? Rola, may, her, her weakness might be in the why. She doesn't believe in the hijab because nobody really has told her, why should I wear it? And why is it you're going to throw me in hell if I don't wear it? And who are you? And I, I wouldn't want to worship such a Lord. Where is her weakness? Is she's never been established a why. If you don't do it with a business, Jaffer will quit. Same with our religion. You have to figure out your why. You can't go and get it from other people. All right. Finding attractive people who believe in what you believe. Finding attractive. Shackleton. Who is Shackleton? He wanted to be the first explorer to reach where? Antarctica. Right? 27 men never reached. Ship sank. Because when they got there, the, it started, the ice, the water started freezing, and they got trapped, and it crushed the ship. And they were left on lifeboats. When this has happened in history, guess what's happened? Fighting, killing, even cannibalism. They've made movies like Alive, where you would see other people eating other human beings to survive. Guess what happened here? They all lived. Why? Because of the way they promoted 
who they were looking for. What do you think happened? No one died. Why? Greater leaders can find good fits. What did Shackleton do? He didn't put out a, a, a blurb saying, come, high lot of money, come be a, a sailor, come work on my ship, you're going to get prestige, we're going to give you everything you want, you're going to get health benefits, everything. This is the way he promoted it. You ready? Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in cases of success. Who are the people that took this job? The prophet was the same way. He told his few companions in the beginning, this is what you're going to have to endure. Are you ready? And those few companions is what spread Islam. He didn't find the weak ones. He found the strong ones. So who are the people that he attracted? Who applied? So you have to ask in your own business, in your own relationships, in your own life, who is applying to get close to you? Well, what is your why? What are you putting out there? Are you doing it because you're for sale? Are you doing it because you're manipulating, because you're making people do it? Or are you doing it to inspire? Shackleton hired only those who shared the belief in survival against all odds. This ensured not just survival, but success. When employees feel a sense of belonging, they innovate and work hard, not just for you, but for themselves. They got together. They went on the life boats. They worked together, and they survived. Not a moment was spared, and that's what gave them survival. And that's what gave them so much success later on. Why? Because Shackleton inspired to people who already were motivated. What is the worst relationship to get in when you're, a, when you're a mother, a father, a husband, and a wife, where you have to wake up every day to motivate somebody from doing their bed to staying away from haram to acting in a loving manner? You will get exhausted. And just like Jaffer, you will be for sale. I get to pick on Jaffer for today. So let's take a picture of him. This might be his last time he's ever here. <laughs> what waitress would you trust and why? Two waitresses. First waitress, you come in. She says, oh, everything on the menu is great. Everything. Here is the specials and everything. Or the waitress says, man, everything is here is horrible except the lasagna. Which one would you trust, the first or the second? Why? Because she's being authentic and honest. So why should somebody trust you? Because that's easy. Why you should trust that person. But why should somebody trust you? Why? Ever think about it? Why is it somebody should trust me with a secret? Because am I known to telling other people where I can't hold a secret? Or do I judge quickly? Why should somebody trust you? Start with why you want a relationship or anything in life. Why should somebody trust you? Everybody take out their phones. What I want you to do is text a loved one, a child, a mother, a father, a husband, or a wife. Say, why do you trust me? And then put your phone away. And then we'll answer it at the end. That's all you say is, why do you trust me? If anybody gets mad at a reply, that means you have an egoic problem we got to work on. <laughs> why do you trust me? You want people to know why do they trust you. Because if it's for the wrong reasons and you're manipulating people, you're not inspiring, then you want to know that. So what a question to ask. If I go to my kids, why do you trust me, Dad? Because if I don't trust you, you're going to slap me. OK. Put your phones away right when you're done. That way, I could begin. Go to the next slide. I'm going fast, because I really want to I wanna end around 9, and I want to do the Q&A. So true or false, great companies don't hire skilled people and motivate them. They hire already motivated people and inspire them. People are either motivated or they are not, true or false. But I promise you, you always thought you could motivate people. Why do I do marriage counseling? The first thing I do is get them accept who they've married and not to motivate them anymore and just motivate and inspire yourself. Man, is that hard to do.
If a snake bites you, should you get mad at the snake? Isn't that what a snake is supposed to do? Some of us are married to snakes. Some of us are married to skeletons. You know, just accept it. He's going to have his moments. Why are you trying to motivate him to change through manipulation? That's your pain. That means you're a different animal. And what do we do? We have a hard, really hard time of accept, accepting people for who they are. Imagine I go to Rola and say, Rola, get out. I don't accept you because you don't wear hijab. Out. Huh? Rhonda. Rhonda, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Rania, <laughs> sorry. Right? She would say, okay. We definitely don't have common beliefs. What happens to the relationship? It's over. If Jaffer feels that we don't have common beliefs and I keep picking on him, what happens to the relationship? It's over. That's why common beliefs and values are so important. What happens to us? We put a facade. What do you want? Well, I want somebody rich who prays, who does really good. But what are you? I don't pray, I'm not rich, and I don't do really good. But maybe he can motivate me to change. What's the likelihood of divorce? Really high. <laughs> In successful relationships, it's not about finding someone and then motivating them. It's about connecting with someone who's already motivated and inspiring each other. People are either motivated or they're not, true or false. Look at Southwest, most profitable airline ever. What did they do? They had all their employees in the 70s dressed like cheerleaders. What type of employees did they attract? Actual cheerleaders. They said, okay, I'll dress like that. Do cheerleaders have to be motivated to cheer people up? Yes or no? No. They already love it because they're already cheering. That's their disposition. That's their character. They didn't have to motivate. They just inspired them. So guess what? They love their job because they're already cheerleaders. Southwest was brilliant at doing that. They wanted people to feel so much love. You ever go to an airline and you're next to a stewardess and she's the most miserable human being in the world? You ask her for anything, she gives you a look. And it makes your whole trip. Southwest, if you go around Southwest employees, they have a completely disposi different disposition. They're really good at that. So now let's talk about relationships. So now, if you have a relationship where you feel like you have to manipulate and you feel like you have to motivate, that relationship will eventually end if you don't change your expectations of that person. What do you have to do? You just have to lower your expectation. That's what happiness is, is when you meet an expectation or exceed it. You have a husband fantasy of your dreams or a wife fantasy or a child fantasy, and you keep waiting by motivating him. You're going to wait until you die. Why don't you just lower your expectations so you can become happy and allow them the space to change and see if they're motivated to change? Anything else is abuse. So there was Rachel and Steve. This is a true story. This is a TED Talk. You can look it up. Rachel and Steve were going in business with another marriage counseling. When they sat down, they started talking about business. The, the marriage counseling couple noticed that the woman wasn't talking. He said, well, what's your input on the business? My husband doesn't share anything with me. I didn't even know he wanted to do a business. He does this to me all the time. Sound familiar? If either you know somebody or you speak that way sometimes, right? Anybody who says they don't fight with their wife, we got to, come on. Okay, we all have our disputes. So Rachel and Steve then were given the four habits. Here are the four habits, quickly. Mental health, okay, but before that, Mental Health Foundation issued a stark warning that the absence of quality relationships is killing us faster than obesity and lack of exercise. If you don't have quality relationships and you want your kids to die faster than anything else, it's just having unhealthy relationships, allowing their mom and dad to see themselves in unhealthy relationships. And I've seen it at school. At WISE, there'll be a married couple. The kids are so happy and jolly. Husband or wife does something, the next year they're the most miserable human beings. Now they're no longer motivated to come to our school. Guess what happens to them the next year? They're gone. Whole life changed. Why? And people are going to be spending the rest of their lives blaming the kids where the whole time it was the parent. When I counsel, even if there's infidelity happening, I said, can you overcome that? And there's a reason why he did that. Lower your expectation. Maybe give him a try for the next two months. See if he's willing to change himself without you reminding him of this abuse, because there's a reason why it happened. But people have a hard time, because 
I'm noticing people are getting divorced. There's no such thing as divorce. When you have kids, man, it's so traumatic. I'm not here to scare you. Actually, I am to scare you. Because you could have a crummy husband. That's one issue. But you lose a child to sin, that's a whole another world that you never want to go through. All right. Single biggest predictor of teenage mental health, guess what? Family breakdown. How do you want to predict mental health? Let's just look at the family structure. So should you be responsible when you get married, making sure that person that you're married has the same values and the same beliefs as you do? How long does that take to figure out? Who could guess? How long? Two months. If you're in a relationship for more than two to three months and it's been a couple years, there's some, that's a huge red flag. You shouldn't have to get to know somebody for longer than two to three months. So who should you get involved with somebody? Somebody who's ready, somebody who's willing. And if they're not ready and willing after two months, then just say, okay, when you're ready and willing, come back and see me. You're not cheap carpet to be used. All right, what do they work on? Well, we need our better fences at the top of the cliff rather than just more ambulances at the bottom. What happens is instead of trying to fix the problem at the top of your relationship, we wait for the relationship to fall apart, and then we bring the ambulances. I'm a person that says, why not change in good times? Why wait for bad times? So four habits of all successful relationships. You ready? People go where they feel welcome, but they stay where they feel valued. This is how you get yourself to be valued. First one, be curious, not critical. What does that mean? Share. Be curious, not critical. What does that mean to you? Okay. Be curious and not critical. Who else could share? What does that mean in a relationship? Why did he leave the toilet seat up? Why did he leave the dishes dirty? Why did he not speak to me in a loving manner? Instead of what do we do? Ask why. Maybe something bad happened at work. Maybe it's from his childhood. But what do we typically respond? We're very what? Critical. Yes or no? But there's a reason. The reason why we're like that is most likely that your parents were like that to you. So if you notice you're overly critical, it's because of parents. Be careful and not crushing. What does that mean? When your husband or wife or your kids make a mistake, what should you do? Should you crush them or should you be careful? Careful. Right? Ask, don't assume. Aren't, we, aren't our minds anticipation machines and we already know why everybody did something wrong? And what do we do? We assume. Doesn't that mess up relationships? Why didn't you call me back? Why didn't you do this? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was sleeping. With who? <laughs> no, I was actually sleeping. <laughs> and some women's or men's minds are drawn that way to be suspicious of everything. Why? Because they were really abused as child. And because of that, everybody now is a potential abuser. And it's called survivor mode. Connect before you correct. If somebody makes a mistake, should you correct them or use it as an opportunity to connect? What's the opposite of addiction? It's in this word. Connection. The reason why somebody is an addict is a misplaced trauma of how to cope with that they're not connected. So anybody who's an addict, you just have to teach them to connect. Connect with who? Allah. And that's the fastest way. And studies have shown that too. What's the opposite of addiction? Connection. So should you ever judge somebody or just use that as an opportunity to connect with them and stop looking at people as a problem but as a reason to connect? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, so Rachel and Steve, they taught this in two weeks. Two weeks later, they meet the marriage counseling couple. They were holding hands. Life changed. Because they were arguing over dumbest things. Her desk was dirty. His desk wasn't. She would make a room, he wouldn't. She would make the bed, he would, whatever. And they realized, let's use this as opportunities to connect. So guess what happened? Rachel was like, do you want to know what's the truth? She says, if my husband would always tell me, when I get angry, I'm going to divorce you, if not for the kids. She said she wrote a letter saying how she was telling my husband, take care of the kids, for if you're going to leave me, and I'm going to go put myself in front of a bus. And that's what I was going to go do. 
says, if my husband was going to leave me, I was just going to go put myself and commit suicide in front of a bus. But by chance, we met you, and you saved my life, and you changed my perspective. How many Rachels and Steves are there? So many. So how many times have you taken the opportunity to connect with somebody and stop being so critical where you could change somebody's life? That was the story of Imam Ali. He, there was a lady who butchered, cursed him. She didn't know it was him. Said, I curse Imam Ali. My husband died in his battle. So Imam Ali says, let me help you. So every day he'd go to her house and help her. He didn't, she didn't know it was the Imam. And she would curse him every day until her daughter came to the house one day and says, Ma, do you know who this is? This is the Imam. And the woman felt embarrassed. Says, I was cursing you. And you didn't say anything. Says, we're not those that show anger. We show patience. And she changed. Why? He used it as an opportunity to connect. That is the story of Imam Ali. All right, what is the limiting thought that you are primed to think about yourself? So let me tell you how limiting thoughts work. Dog got hit by a car, was pregnant. It had three more puppies. Each puppy was limping. So they thought it was because of the car accident. They took it to a veterinarian and said, all my dogs are limping. So they did an x-ray. Guess what they found out about the legs? Nothing wrong. So they said, why are they limping? Because the mom had a car accident and the mom is limping ever since. So it's a learned behavior. So you are not created for failure. It's a learned behavior by trying to fulfill everyone's expectation. That's it. If you're noticing you're limping in life, your money isn't right, your relationships ain't right, your education, it, all it is is that means you were given a bad program. So now, how do we reprogram ourselves? Okay. Um, so one thing that you have to have is mutual respect. Were you shown mutual respect by your parents when you were a child? Now I want us to go back to a child. Do you show mutual respect to your wife and your kids the same way they respect you? Then ask yourself, did my parents do it for me? Are you there? Just answer yes or no to yourself. Because if you don't show mutual respect to the people when you're angry. How do you know you show mutual respect? That even when you're angry, you're still in a loving manner. Most likely, when your parents got, got angry, where did they dump it on? You. So how do you reprogram that? You first have to see, where did I get this emotion from? This is how you reprogram. Next one, compassion and mercy. Because wouldn't you want somebody that gives you mutual respect, yes or no? Would you want somebody that gives you compassion and mercy, yes or no? But do you give it? Or are you critical? Or are you any of these? Do you correct? Do you assume? Do you crush people? Right? Next one, honesty and trustworthy. Are you honest? Are you trustworthy? Well, were your parents honest and trustworthy? What devastates a child is when they worship a, their parents, because they're at the worship level. And then they see their father or mom do something haram that they've been preaching not to do for so long. It devastates a kid. Say, Ma, you've been telling me not to do this, but now you're doing it? So are you not as honest and trustworthy because your parents weren't? Patience, forgiveness. When you made mistakes, were your par pa parents forgiving? Did they give you benefit of the doubt? Did they give you second? So now what we're going to do, and shared faith. So if you want... Patience and forgiveness, honesty, compassion, mutual respect, and shared faith, you better be these things. Now, what happens if you attract a woman who's got good faith, who's patient, who's honest, who's compassionate, who's mutual, but you're not? You know, sometimes we put this facade, we're ready to get married, and we say, yeah, I am these things. Then what happens two years later? What does the wife figure out? You're missing on one. And if you're missing just on one, what will happen to that relationship? Over. That's where premarital counseling comes in. It says, wait, this person isn't these five. Are you willing to accept that he might have some trust issues? And if you could accept it, just like the Antarctica people could accept that they may not survive, guess what? Then it'll be okay. But if you marry somebody with very high expectations, the likelihood is now divorce. 
So we have to lower the expectations of ourselves and higher the expectations of, I mean, of people and higher the expectations of who? Who's brave enough to come up on stage and do the test? Whoa, we got one. Come on. Any older brothers? That's brave enough. You're too honest. <laughs> Any older brothers? All right, come on. All right. Can somebody? So we're going to do the same thing. You can sit this way. this way. Anybody in your relationship that would like to do this? That's married. Any sister want to do it? Any sister want to do it? Somebody who's either married or a sister that's married. You married? Come on. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We got somebody. Come on. Let's give them a large salawat. We're doing good on time. We're going to end right after this. All right. So again, you're going to raise your hand if the person is authentic or not. Okay, first question. You ready? We're going to quickly go through this. Now, if, they, if I didn't have any volunteers, I would be asking you the same question. So also answer it in your own mind. You ready? First. Oh, shaitan's working. <laughs> All right, first question. Reflecting on your childhood relationships, can you describe the nature of your relationship with your family members during your childhood? How do you feel these relationships have influenced your approach to current personal or romantic relationships? So how has your childhood impacted your relationships? Go. Um, I'm the eldest of my family. Uh, we're a family of four boys and my father and my mother. Uh, I'm, I mean, three, I have three younger siblings and like just remembering how we grew up, um, sometimes I feel like I failed my brothers in terms of being, you know, the older, like the older sibling leading the family. I feel like I have that responsibility. And why do you think he feels like a failure? Because what does society say? If you're not married by this age, if you don't have this much money by this age or this degree by this age, then you're a failure. And where did he get that condition from? His family. Is it true that it has anything to do with Islam? No. Because I know people who are his age who are married, money, relationships, but are miserable. So you're not a failure, no matter what your family has ever said. Say it. I'm not a failure no matter what my family expects of me or says. Only care about well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then your family will naturally be happy. Yeah. Salawat. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the next question. Or do you want to answer this one? I can answer this one. Okay, go ahead. Uh, alhamdulillah, I come from a loving family. I have three sisters. Is his mom here? No. <laughs> 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 no, sir. Uh, alhamdulillah, I come from a loving family and to be honest, by having like three sisters, they're all really, really close. Alhamdulillah, we're all close in general, but some three, they're like, they're always doing their thing. And that's why I feel like I got close with my mom and my father. Very because good. I'm like with them. Very good. Do, you, do your daughters, do your sisters, I'm sorry, do everything for you? They'll help me out, of course. We're all there for each other. Who cleans the house? <laughs> <laughs> Will that have an impact with his wife maybe one day? Where his wife is saying, why did you leave that dish? Why don't you ever wash your clothes? Sound familiar? Yes, sir. Yeah. So is that something you will have to reprogram? Of course, yeah. yes. It's called spoiled syndrome. We've all <laughs> told you you have to have thick skin. By the way, these are counseling sessions happen. Then you realize why you're like this. It's not because of the person in front of you. It's because of the program. And if you know that, guess what? You could change. That's how you could save 90% of marriages. Obviously, abuse and other things, it's hard. 
but the other 90 you could save. All right, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. So um, as growing up, I seen my mom and dad, how they lived and treated each other most of the time and how they loved each other and respected each other. So I don't know, I grew up as a like a responsible person. Right. I was like 16. Were you able to express healthy anger? Healthy anger? Yeah. Well, sometimes I do get angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to express your emotions? What would happen when you express your emotions to your mom and dad? Um, yeah, I would yell sometimes, I would be angry. No, when you were a child and you felt certain ways, were you allowed to express yourself emotionally freely? Yes. Or did you feel responsible for their happiness and you had to hit a plateau to make it happy? You had to get a grade, you had to do this, you had to do that? No. no. So you didn't? No. Okay. Do most people feel that? Yes. And if your happiness from your parents was dependent on you doing something, that's a form of abuse. It goes against the teachings of Ahl Bayt, especially up to the age of seven. All right, next question. You'll start. Come on. There's only three or, three or four questions. We'll go quick. Recurring patterns in relationships. Have you ever noticed recurring patterns on, on, on themes in your relationship that you could trace back to your childhood experience? For example, how you handle conflict, express affection, or establish trust. How you handle affection, trust, is that anything that stemmed from your childhood? I don't know. I like I was raised to be, you know, to be honest all the time. My parents trusted me. What would happen if you broke your parents' trust? What would happen? Um, well, they wouldn't trust me no more. But is that fair? I mean, like they wouldn't. They wouldn't tell me to do things and trust me with them no more. Okay, but how did they handle conflict? Because you said there was, they, they, they triggered each other. How did they handle conflict? I don't understand what. what how did they handle conflict? Like how did they not handle argue? conflict? How did your okay, parents handle like conflict? Like if they were arguing about something, my mom would always be the one, and I learned this from my mom. Like she would be the patient one. Okay, it's okay. She would handle it. Like take it, uh, you know, like not make it a big deal. What do you think would happen to you if you if you noticed that your parents would give each other silent treatment for three days, for a week? Anybody ever experienced that? No. I have. Did it impact me? It has. Right? I saw the silent treatment. I saw the neglect. And. I realize that I have a bad program. So if you did, would, would, you, would that have affected you right now in your life decisions? Absolutely. Yes. Something that reoccurred. Probably the way I handle things, certain things, of course. I feel like I overreact when it's not necessary to. Okay. So have people weird. ever overreacted with you when there was, you felt it wasn't necessary? Oh, yeah. Okay. So what? now is that a learned behavior? Sometimes, sometimes not. I think it's just something I've had in my childhood, you know? Right. So you notice, if you don't like that behavior when people do it to you, then we should catch it and say, I'm not going to do it to other people. Yes, Very good. For me, I remember a lot of, um, we had a lot of conflicts. Like, there was a lot of back and forth with me and my parents, for example, or me and my brothers. So it's like, my mom always says, it's like, as if me and my brothers are fighting like Tom and Jerry. And then, but it also was between me and them too as well. Um, like we would yell at each other constantly. So you notice the first 10 years, 15 years, we take it, we take it, we take it. Then what do we eventually do? We treat them the same way. Yeah. And then the tension. And then it's, I'm going to kick you out. That's a, and what we do is we start looking for things from people that don't have it. Your parents can't give you something that they don't have. So if they don't know how to show peace, don't know how to show mercy, it's because of their childhood. So when are you going to kill that generational curse and stop waiting to allow people to change for you to change? Why don't you become that change and stop using your parents as an excuse why you are the way you are? Anything bad in your life, it's because you are given a bad program. God has created you perfectly. Anything hard, be it a relationship, job, anything, it's just that you were given a bad program. That's why people who are very wealthy, they could be stupid, low IQ, but they were given a really good program from childhood. 
The parents every day told them, you're great. You can make it. You're a hard worker. Look what you did. Low IQ, they become the most successful people. Why? Because that was the program. So you have to figure out what is something that you have to reprogram about yourself and to change your reality. What do we do? We don't like to do that about ourselves. That's why every night you say, who's the best version of myself tomorrow? Then at the next night you say, how did I do? Where did the program fail me? Okay, this is how I'm gonna answer next time to my kids. This is the next time I'm gonna answer when my husband drives me crazy or my kids. I'm gonna act in a loving manner, irrespective of how anybody treats me. And if you do that, you're changing the program. We'll go one more. Thinking back about your childhood, we'll, just add, we'll have one of you share. We'll have just you share, because of time. Thinking back to your childhood, with coping mechanisms, did you develop in response to stressful or challenging situations? Do you see your coping mechanism influencing how manage difficulties in current relationships? So if you start analyzing your life this way, and you say, okay, this is why I'm always broke. Because my parents were always broke and they struggled. That was the program. Everything is hard, they used to tell me. Nothing is easy, life is hard, the universe conspires against you. Michael Jackson just said, they showed a video, he said, Music is a mantra. We just keep you, get you to say the same things over and over again till you believe it. That's what they did with the black community, right? I'm a loser. Break up with your boyfriend because I'm bored. On and on and on. That's the program. That's why you shouldn't listen to haram music. Not because a scholar told you it's haram, because it's common sense. Why would I want to be programmed to believe in this? Let's forget about the world. Um, live free. You know, some of the dumbest titles. Why? Because they want to program you. So go ahead. Um, for me, grow growing up with these conflicts um, at home, uh, like the, all the yelling, all the, it, it, it would reach really frustrating levels where we would yell on the top of our lungs at each other um, to the point my mother would cry, you know, or I would get extremely frustrated. But um, because I didn't want to see that anymore, I started developing like, like coping by just being conflict avoidant. So watch this. What are things in your life that are hard right now? Hard right now? Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, trying to get married. Trying to get married. What else? Um, work. Work, finding a job. Yeah. So now every day I have parents who don't know how to cope. They're always thinking the world is conspiring against them. Nothing goes their way. Guess what? Now, why is it hard for him to find a job? Well, I have a job. Well, not, or find a job that he wouldn't <laughs> quit for five bucks, right? <laughs> well, why is it hard for him where he thinks to get married? It's because of the program. So what does he have to do? First thing yeah. is forgive his parents. Why? Because they couldn't give him what they didn't have. And to accept them, and they're coming probably from a third world country where they grew up in war, mm. right? Yeah. yeah. The so, have. The, so they saw trauma. Yeah. So now they got him out. But now he's still in this trauma and this program. So how do you reprogram yourself? Is that's where you listen to the Holy Quran. That's where you start reprogramming yourself. That's why our scholars say, listen to the Quran often, every day. That's what the, even the Prophet would say, as often as you can. Why? It'll reprogram you. And it'll put you in a condition that you need nobody but Allah. It changes your belief system. And that's what's the beauty about Islam. And that's why he's coming here every week, because he wants to reprogram himself. So now he's no longer blaming his parents, blaming his boss, blaming anybody else. He just realizes he has a program that he has to change. What happens when you change the program on your TV? Change the channel. Change the channel. Do you get a different picture? Yeah. You change the frequency. As soon as he changes the frequency, what happens to his, what he sees? Changes. So if you want to change the channel of your life, you just got to change your frequency. The wife comes, the money comes, and that's the ability Allah has given you. That's why Allah says, we've honored the children of Adam. We've honored you. But if you think the world is conspiring against you, you're going to find every reason to prove your parents right, that they were right. And this is where you got to take your free will back. Masjid all authentic? Yes, let's give them a large salawat. Thank you, guys. So we're doing a retreat, and it's three days of this. And it's reprogramming. So how do you reprogram? There's only two ways. What are the only two ways? 
Does this talk reprogram you? No. That's consciousness. The program is habits. Two ways to reprogram. Habits. He's got to change his habits. What's the biggest addiction? Thinking. This is how I'm going to start thinking about this. I'm no longer going to go in a spiral. I'm going to give excuses. Or you do hypnosis meditation. That's the way. So talk to the person next to you. What's one way you're going to start reprogramming yourself with a new habit? I'm going to read more Quran. I'm going to stop talking to that negative Nancy. What is one thing in your life to be able to reprogram yourself? Have that conversation with the person next to you. Go. Anybody, if everybody could take out their phones too. All right, quickly, who's going to start a new habit to inspire others? Somebody share. Let's go. Go. I'm sorry? So if you want to be there for people, like, that one couple, the other couple was there for, all you have to do is be there for Allah. So that's why you pray on time. If you ever want Allah to give you opportunities in life and reprogram yourself, just pray on time. Now that's a new habit, right? Because it's work. It's this. Well, I don't even pray. Try it for 20 days. Try it for 30 days. You want to reprogram yourself? The quickest way to reprogram yourself, our scholars say, pray on time. Watch what happens to you, and Allah gives you an opportunity. Because if you haven't gotten an opportunity recently to help somebody, that means maybe Allah is ignoring you. When is the last time you had an opportunity to help somebody? Be it on the street, be it if they're stuck on the road, be it a flat tire. And if you don't have an opportunity to help somebody, that means there's something wrong with the program. Okay? Why do people trust you? Who would like to respond? Would anybody get a cool reply? Go. Why do people, why did you, who did you text first of all? Your sister. Why does your sister trust you? Because, <laughs> but what happens if you're having a crummy day? Hassan, go. Your sister. Ah, because you've never given me a reason not to trust you. Who else would like to answer? Go. Ah, I trust you because the reason why I trust people for me is when I have something good to me, they're happy for me. And when something bad happens to me, they're unhappy. Who are the people that I don't trust? When I do something good, they're unhappy. When I do something bad, they're happy. Those are enemies. One more share. You what? Your mom? Because I raised you. Very good. If you got the response, what did you do? <laughs> then we know there's some work we have to do. So what we're doing August, I mean February 23rd to the 25th, we do three days. It's a retreat. Uh, basically, one, it's about getting ready for Ramadan. Two, it's peace meditations. And the main focus is to reprogram yourself, break the habit of yourself to get closer to Allah. Here's if you do want to sign up for it, it's here. Here's a quick video. Oh, we need audio. Ah, Shaitan's working, sorry. <laughs>
one thing that I think I can is just this really that I just um, to me focus and it's good for like the mind, body, whole spirit of me. Um, and for our listeners, for our, our own selves. So we're going to be, we have a couple added things. One, we have a babysitting service this time because people kept asking. We do have shuttle service from here to Chicago. The reason why I do it in Chicago is because you have nowhere else to go. Middle of winter, you're, you're not in downtown Chicago, you're in a hotel, you're in a room like this for three days. And we do healings too. And those are, those are the most important things that we do. And we've, we have so many testimonials to share and we can share at a later time. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to take about 10 people's blood, blood test. What we do is one week before and then the day after, we check their blood again. And I'm going to show the impact the, the body could have when you're in a meditative state for just five days, just for four days, how it affects your immune system. And we're going to show that evidence through blood work. Because I believe if you connect to Allah, it just takes a few days of having true prayer, prayer from the heart, where your body will respond every time. And in every case, there's cancer and disease. It's because of long-term stress. 95 to 99% of cancer and disease is because of stress. How about you remove that stress and you replace that emotion, which is probably caused from the past, with some elevated emotion like love, mercy, gratitude. You do that just for three days, your body transform, and we've witnessed that. And that's what I love about our faith. So thank you. Um, if you would like to join the WhatsApp group, we have food and refreshments. Inshallah, we'll see everybody. Um, what time is it? Ah, we better next week. Uh, nine, or just come back up here at 10 o'clock. See everybody up who wants to do the meditation. And let's thank Haj Hassan again with the large salawat for joining us. Allah.